Okay, this morning we're going to be doing a quick video on some of the basic, uh, I like to call them the ad ats, but these are some of SQL Server's um, built-in tools that you can use for your advantage. So I'm going to write them down really fast, that way I know which ones I'm going over. I'm not going to be going over all of them, but I'm going to be doing a series where I go over some of the ones that are commonly used and that are very helpful. And um, that way we can uh, learn about these. As a note, you can Google these usually, like T-SQL and like server name, add at server name right here, for instance, and it'll pull up an MSDN article. It'll show you some things that you can do. I do realize that some people are more visual learners, and so a video is more helpful walking through. But if you like reading, Microsoft offers all of this. Um, there's nothing wrong with reading. So <clears throat> let's go with the first one, add at server name. Very useful if you work in an environment where there's a lot of servers and instances. Not very useful if you only have one to work with. And I've worked at one company where there was just one. So, but this is very useful. Returns the server name, server slash instance. Um, or in this case, quick note on the server name here. And that is, um, it's, it can be very useful. What I should say is that it can be very useful if you're doing, if you have a lot of servers that you're working with. One of the things that you can do, for instance, let me just show you is you can declare serve varcar in this case we'll do 50 and we can select uh, serve equal to server name and then select serve and you'll see it returns that and then you can do you know if serve equals the server that you're on uh, begin and uh, print Yay. Okay, and why would this be important? Well, again, in my environment, we develop the code and then it's run in production by someone else. A lot of times, it's not run by us. Well, so what happens when someone is careless and dumb, there's a lot of servers, and they don't pay attention to which server that they are on, what happens? It inserts something into a mirror table or creates something that shouldn't be created. So one of the reasons why I, I'll use server name a lot is to verify what server it's on. Um, because I've, I've learned this, when you pass your code on to someone else to use, sometimes they don't verify things. So I've learned to just make my code as dummy proof as possible um, in certain situations. So that's that's some of the use of there. And again, um, another example of how that's useful is uh, if you have 100,000 servers, or not 100,000, 100 servers, and their name differs by one digit, and the server names are strings of 50 to 75 characters. It's just a lot faster to do this um, than sit there and type it out, you know, copy and paste, change the one digit, and go from there. All right, next one, select add add version. Very useful for what exactly is this? Um, it's 2008 R2, great, that's a great, great SQL server there. Um, and it's Express Edition, 64-bit. This kind of tells you some information. Very, very useful if you have a production environment that is enterprise and you have a development environment. Um, you will notice that there are differences. If you don't believe me, go to Microsoft's site. There are differences between Express. There's differences between development. There's differences between enterprise and so on and so forth. Very useful right here. Also, we'll tell you if you're on 2005, 2008, 2008 R2, um, and 2012. Okay. And uh, I want to actually do row count first. So select row count. One. Okay, so, and we've used this in a previous video, but let's just go ahead and um, add to it. Let's just use a table here. Okay, cool. This, this will work. I'm tempted to say this is going to be an incrementing one, but let's do, let's add to the table. So insert into, add to it, and name, we'll just insert name. I'm going to insert the other. We'll see if I'm able to do this. I'm thinking that ID is uh, an identity. Now let's select John, and let's do if row count does not equal one, begin print error, end, else, begin print oh. Oops. Okay, so 
let's get rid of the select. Done. Okay. Now let's go back to the select. So row count really quickly. I'm trying to do two things at once: speaking and talking. Actually, it's not. What do you know? Um, row count is returns information or looks at the the last query, the last um, T SQL batch executed. So when we did the insert, it is looking at this statement right here. And if the row count does not equal one, then um, it will print an error. If the row count equals one, it prints done. Notice we selected John. Um, we're just inserting one value. As a case in point, let me do this one second right here. I'm going to execute this again. And you'll notice now that there's two rows, right? Okay. Now let's run the statement again. And let's note one row effect. Now notice, row count doesn't calculate what was done here. It doesn't return two, right? Even though the select star was two rows. It only looks at the last statement. That's important to know. Why is this useful? Okay, let's suppose you need to insert 830 rows in a table. Um, okay, you can use the row count like here, and if the row count doesn't eat eight, equal 830, it will throw an error or basically not commit the transaction. Um, when it, way back in the day when I was first working with SQL Server, Server and I was importing, it was from my own database, Echo Boomer Data, I wiped out, I think it was 700 rows of data. This is a, one of the most effective ways of learning, make a huge mistake. And um, I had to re-import it, and I mean, it was like a three-hour process to get it all back again. And so I learned the value of um, begin tran, uh, rollback tran, and commit tran using the row count. And I actually have a previous video on that, so you can look at minimizing errors, I think is the name of the video. It's very useful, probably one of the best videos, because um, all it takes is one mistake and you're in trouble. All right, and nest level. Nest level is very useful, kind of interesting. So if we select nest level, oops, nothing, right? This refers to uh, stored procedures. This basically displays the nest level of an execution of a stored procedure in a sense, basically, in other words, if a stored procedure calls another stored procedure. So let's create a procedure, and we will call this STP level 3 Oops. as begin and we will do select nest level as level 3 let me get rid of this Okay, and then we're going to create another one called STP level two. And in level two, we are going to execute and then we will make one called store procedure level one. Whoops. And we will, in stored procedure one, we will execute level two. So, based on what we just did here, we created a stored procedure level three, level two, and level one. In level one, we're looking at the nest level, but we're calling stored procedure level two. In level two, we're looking at the nest level of the level two stored procedure, and then we're calling a level three. Uh, store procedure level three, I'm sorry. And then of course in level three, we're just selecting the nest level. So what do you think happens when we call the very first store procedure? Uh, wow. In level one, prints out level one, it calls level two, prints out level two, in level three, it prints out level three. So now, of course, the biggest question is, okay, so that's what it does. I mean, it selects the nest level of the stored procedure, stored procedure, which calls another stored procedure, which calls another stored procedure. Why is that useful? Let's suppose that 
uh, stored procedure level three, which um, we had a process in which stored procedure, uh, let's see, one of our stored procedures was called in one chain of processes on level two, and on a different process was called on level four. And when it was called on level four, we would want it to do one other thing. Now there's two things we could do. We could create two separate stored procedures, but since the code is almost identical except for one line, we could also, you know, for instance, an alter stored procedure, oops, level three, which we had, we could declare nest int we could select nest equal to the nest level because we're in stored procedure level three if nest equals three we could select three or in this case well I forgot the beginning call which Again, in this case, if we were actually doing a process, it would run this process. If we're in the second level, we could just do two. Now, right now, as y'all know, stored procedure level three is only called on that chain of three, right? But let's suppose we decided to, okay, let's get rid of this, and let's create procedure STP uh, level four, well, not level four, uh, level other as begin and then let's do select nest oops, nest level and let's do execute stp level three now what do you think happens when you execute level other it produces two instead of three, whereas three produces three, TP uh, level one, it produces three when we call it in this process. Now, again, this would be very useful if you had a stored procedure that you didn't want to create a whole nother stored procedure and it only differs by a little bit and then you could select which nest level it's in. Um, but one of my uh, stored procedures that I use in my stock analysis database, it is the fifth line of a stored procedure, or it is the second line of a stored procedure. But when it's the fifth line of a stored procedure, I want it to update a admin table. And so I go ahead and I select that nest level, keep that nest level, and if it's in the fifth one, then I update that table. So that's these four, add at server name, add at version, add at row count, add at nest level, and some of the ways that you can use those.